So basically, the millennium and this entire period of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, is all about fulfilling the rule of Jesus as Messiah. You see on this slide, the millennium, the thousand year reign. Remember, millennium is mille, that's the Latin word for a thousand, annum, that's the Latin word for years. So mille is 1,000, annum is years. That term is six times, millennium is six times mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. And that time period is described, see the slide, promised to David in three chapters, predicted in the Psalms and Prophets in 31 chapters, promised to Mary and to the apostles in five chapters. It's in the Lord's chapter and it's described in Psalm 2. There are over 40 chapters of the Bible that describe this period, this event, 40 chapters. The millennium, what is it like? Well, those 40 chapters, if I summed them up, would be this. There are physical changes on the earth. The climate changes, the animals change, the curse is rolled back, uh, lifted, Isaiah says in Isaiah 11. Creation is redeemed. Do you remember it says in, in you see on the slide, Romans 8, 20 to 22, all creation is groaning for the Lord to return and rule. The earth, it says in Isaiah 11, 9, is filled with the knowledge of the Lord. That's repeated in Habakkuk, another book about this event. Habakkuk 2.14 says, the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord like the waters cover the seas. So this is a unique time of God's presence being seen. But it's not eternity. This, don't confuse the millennium with heaven and dwelling in our Father's house. Because death and sin are still present, they're just kind of pushed back. Everyone has their land. That's what Micah 4.15 says. And Amos tells us it's fruitful, but it's not heaven. So what happens next? The next event, the sixth event of the seven on your prophetic chart is the final rebellion. Look what it says in uh, starting in verse seven, which I've alluded to over and over. When the thousand years have expired, Satan is released. So look at this. Satan is chained. Now... Chains taken off, doorway is opened, Satan comes out to do, look what he does. To be released from his prison, he will go and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gathers them gathered to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded. Do you remember? I told you they're coming from everywhere, surrounding the visitor center, the millennial temple, and what's here? The camp of the saints. See how it says that? They surround the camp of the saints, verse 9 of Revelation 20, and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And the Lord just does one thing. Look what it says in verse 9. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into, look at this, the devil is cast into the lake of fire. So Satan is cast into the lake of fire. He is loosed. He deceives one last time. He's cast into the lake of fire. Verse 10 continues. Um, fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, wait a minute. When Jesus returns in the Armageddon scene in chapter 16 and 19, the beast and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. The devil joins them. Wow. That's what you'll see this on this slide. Let me just review with this graphic. The church on earth, the rapture, John 14, Luke 24, Acts 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Bema seat, we talked about that last hour uh, with the whole judgment of our works and our wedding garment. The tribulation, Christ's second coming, the thousand year reign, 
Now we're at that brown box there, the rebels and the great white throne, and then heaven is home, life is camping. Do you know what I like? I like the fact that the saints camp. Camping. Do you ever go camping? You know, camping is where you go out and lay on the ground and get dirty and smell like smoke and you have outdoor toilets and you can't wait to roll up your tent and go home. Heaven is home. Notice it says camp of the saints. Note they stay close to God's temple, close to each other. That has always been God's desire that we stay close to him, that we never get comfortable with the world. Peter and Paul remind us that our lives here are like living in a tent. Uh, heaven is home. Life is camping. The best is yet to come. This world is not our home. We're just pilgrims and strangers. That's what 2 Peter 1 says. So, the release of Satan and his doom. When Satan is released, Satan deceives the nations. But what's terrible is to think that people could sink so low that after 1,000 years of every year coming three times to visit God, to see the saints, to meet Jesus Christ, that people still rebel. That's, that's boggling. There's perfect justice, perfect peace, perfect health, perfect agriculture, and yet once the old dragon gets out, everyone follows him again. You know what the Lord shows us? I want you to think about this, especially you young people. A perfect environment will not produce perfect people. There's so many that want to go clean up the earth and they want to get pure water and get, and pure water is important and food is important and, and cleaning up all the, you know, slums is really noble. But a perfect environment will never produce perfect people because only a new heart. See, that's why Ezekiel 36, remember chapter 40 is this millennial temple, but Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. Remember yesterday uh, in hour 18, I said the 108 verses every believer should know. That's another one of that list. A new heart also I will give you, a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll take away your stony heart. Do you know what the, the millennium proves? That everyone, even though their parents come in as, as believers, each succeeding generation, if God doesn't give you a new heart and a new spirit like he wants to, you'll just join in to the rebellion against God. A perfect environment won't ever make perfect people, only a new heart. One lesson from the camp of the saints, I'll never forget, our dear friends, we went camping on Prince Edward Island many years ago. We took a family with us that never camped in their life. And so, of course, they went out and bought a tent, and they bought cots, and they bought, they just got everything to go camping. And it rained most of the time we were there. But I'll never forget the putting up of our tents. I came out with this little um, plastic-topped mallet that my wife got, and I gently tapped our stakes in. And our friends, uh, Rick, was uh, watching. He says, wow, he says, you aren't putting your stakes in very deep. I said, no, no, no. Camping, you've got to be able to pull them up quick. Well, he had one of those mallets with a wooden head that looked like a circus tent, you know, one that you bury stakes about that deep. And he came and he buried his stakes. He said, I want it to blow away. And his stakes were so far in the ground, you couldn't even see them. Reminds me of something. I, I know I should, uh, I should have warned him. I tried to warn him. But you know what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 13? It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured, and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Do you know what pilgrim or sojourner means? It means you go through life not burying your tent stakes. We're supposed to realize that we're pilgrims and strangers on earth, that our earthly life, our bodies are like a tent. And soon we're going to have to fold up this tent and go home. Heaven is home. Dwelling in our Father's house is home. Do you know what most believers do? Like our friends camping. 
they bury their tent stakes so deep that going to heaven, they kind of back toward heaven. This world and their, their possessions and everything is what they're longing for. And God says, this world is not your home. And people end up backing toward heaven. It's like a tractor beam pulling them because their tent stakes are too deep. Remember that we're pilgrims and strangers.